from the American Academy of Neurology. I'm Dr. Daniel Correa. This is the Brain and Life Podcast. Let's think back to your morning. When you woke up, most people here listening probably got out of bed, stood up on their own two feet, and started thinking about how they were going to get dressed. Now, think of the challenges that many people in our community may encounter just with that, just transitioning from bed out into your space and room, maybe to a wheelchair, and then going through coordinating your arms and legs to get dressed. Many people live with neurologic impairments and mobility limitations that make that task a significant challenge. Our guest today, Wesley Hamilton, was featured in season four of Queer Eye, where his story about being injured from a gunshot wound to his spinal cord and his recovery was such a significant impact in his life and was featured again on their most recent season, where he joins the Queer Eye team and helping another guest. Wesley shares with us not only about his own spinal cord recovery, but how he worked on himself as a man and as a father. I really enjoyed this discussion, and I hope you all do too. Make sure to listen through to the end where we continue the discussion with Dr. Barth Green, a neurosurgeon in Miami and an advocate for spinal cord injury community members worldwide. Now stay tuned in the coming weeks for a discussion on brain health and how it's impacted by our sleep. We've touched a little bit on this, but we're going to go further into this discussion on brain health and sleep with Dr. Jennifer Milano. Welcome back. So today on the Brain and Life podcast, our guest has turned a traumatic tragedy into truly a new perspective on life and how he defines and expresses himself. We will hear from Wesley Hamilton himself about his injury and trauma, but most importantly, he has not shied away from the reality that it opened opportunities for self-improvement and development as a person and father to his daughter. During his recovery, he trained as a dietitian and in 2015 founded the nonprofit Disabled But Not Really to advocate and support others on their journey to a new stage of courage and confidence in their life with disability. Thank you so much, Wesley, for joining us. Uh, Thank you for having me, Daniel. I really appreciate it. So I'd like to go back. You've talked about, you know, really your life has had different stages. And, you know, at age 22... I imagine your life and perspectives on things changed a lot when you became a father. And then things flipped on their head again for you at age 24. Introduce us to the Wesley and your life before your daughter at age 22, and then how things quickly changed in the following two years. You know, I appreciate that question. And prior to, you know, the age 22, I was just a product of my environment. I'm an African-American male that grew up on the east side of Kansas City. And most people, when they hear that reference, might not understand what that means. But for me, just think of someone that has grown up in a place their whole life, but never could see themselves outside of that area. So, I mean, my block radius was all I knew. So my mindset was very limited to what I could do, what I thought I could do, or who even who I thought I could be. And because of that, I just grew up very negative. I always had this resent for life due to the fact of not having the same opportunities as others. And because of that, I think I lived day by day just trying to survive. I never had ambition to be more because I was still that product of my environment because I wasn't surrounded by leaders that actually rose above their circumstances, looked at their environment as just a place that they could learn, but they were willing to go and explore and grow. Instead, we were all just literally trying to learn from each other, which kept us like crabs in a bucket. (laughs) I always wanted to do things that were outside of the box, outside of my community. I went to different schools. I was just a person that was literally trying to survive with the only opportunities that I could see. 
So you had a very negative perspective on your possibilities and very little sense of, you know, future beyond the day to day, as you mentioned. Um, and then at age 22, you became a father. What changed for you about thinking about your life and time and, and that day to day lifestyle? When I think about it, I never thought I was going to make it past the age of 21. So having a little girl at 22 wasn't necessarily something I planned on, <laughs> but it, it was probably the most profound thing that had happened to me in life because it was the ability to see my perspective on life shift because now I had a reason to live. My mindset was... I want to guide my daughter into a different life than the one that I'm living currently. So everything for me changed being a father. And I think that was the moment that I started to believe that I could grow into something that I, I, I couldn't see. So you're starting yourself on, on a path you know, beyond what you ever even saw was the horizon. And she was such a positive sh change and focus in your perspective. And soon after, <laughs> things changed again for you. Same way I just put it, you know, my daughter coming into my life allowed me to see a life that I, I really couldn't see, right? But I started doing things that was more responsible as an adult. <laughs> and then leading up to close to around my daughter's second birthday, I was shot multiple times in my abdomen after a verbal altercation that left me paralyzed from the waist down. They T11, T12, incomplete spinal cord injury. And that alone in itself changed my perspective on life. It changed even my perspective on parenting. January 14th, 2012 was the day my life changed forever. And so for our listeners, the more specifically, just sort of describe that. So at the top of your low back, the bottom of the thoracic spine, you had an injury that almost completely injured your whole spinal cord. That's when you say, you know, a near complete, um, you know, so not a complete cut of your spinal cord, but injured everything to the point where you lost a lot of the function and ability of both of your legs. I think the bullets did more damage to the nerves themselves than the actual spinal cord, which led to, you know, the disconnect in my mobility. And absolutely. You went into the hospital for this gunshot trauma, not even sure about how healthy or if you would come out of it. And I imagine then you needed surgery and time in the ICU. Tell us a little bit more about those first few moments getting to the hospital and the initial sort of understanding of what was going on. Absolutely. I woke up. It's my birthday weekend. I'm ready to go out. I'm ready to enjoy myself. And I get in this altercation that leaves me lying on the ground, you know, two holes in my chest, people running all around. And frankly, I thought I was going to die. Okay. I remember holding my best friend's hand because he was there at that moment and just looking at him and saying, you know, man, I'm about to die. And I ended up getting into, you know, the ambulance and, you know, being driven to a hospital. And I just remember the doctor holding my hand and saying, what's your name? And me looking up and just saying, help me. And then pass out, wake up. And at this moment, my eyes are open, but I can't speak. I have a tube going down my throat. All I can do is visualize my, my intermediate family, my mom, my brothers, my sister, my dad. And they're just... They're looking at me. I'm in ICU at this moment. And, you know, everyone's emotional. I don't know what's happened to me. I don't know anything more than I I'm alive, right? Never in my life would I thought I was paralyzed. That just never clicked. So I kept having to be sedated because I was trying to put this tube out. So wake up, go right back to sleep. Wake up, go right back to sleep. It was a repetitive thing until I was able to get out of ICU. And so when I finally got into the hospital room, this means you have a couple of therapists coming in. You have some doctors coming in. They're trying to see if you have any mobility. Uh, of course, they might already know what you're dealing with, but they're just trying to figure out if there's anything waking up in this matter of 
48, 72 hours. I don't know what that looks like, but that's how I felt. What it did for me, though, was already let me know there was a problem before I was told there was a problem. So within this next two weeks, we went through the same process. By the end of that second week, I feel like that's when I was actually told really what happened. And it could have been sooner, but everything just seemed like it just took forever. Um, and that's when the doctor actually finally came to me, told me, you know, Mr. Hamilton, you have a T11, T12 and complete spinal cord injury due to your gunshot wounds. And basically you, wouldn't, you, you just won't be able to walk again. If you're trying to get motor function, it probably ain't going to happen. <laughs> Everything I heard was, you're not going to walk again. This is over. My reaction to that, I was hurt. I was, how am I supposed to live this life, right? Like, how am I supposed to live a life that, one, I hadn't been introduced to, not in a normal accepting way you know so for me i was thinking you know i'm being this wheelchair i'm about to you know one how i'm gonna be a father in a wheelchair you know i just got custody of my daughter she's only two like all these things like i can't am i gonna be able to work like i mean it was i mean it was even it was so many questions that were left unanswered i think that's that that was the process it was now I'm clueless. Now, now I have this ability to either accept or go into denial. And I went more into denial because I just believed I was going to be that miracle. What do you think was able to sustain you and you know, give you some outlook and, and, as you say, life or hope? Most people are putting their fears on you. It doesn't matter that you're a medical professional. If you feel and hear something about a traumatic injury and you've already thought to yourself, you don't know what you would do if it happened to you, you're putting those thoughts and fears on someone else. Like, I never had anyone that gave me more than their sympathy. And because of that, it made me feel like I was less. It made me feel like there was not more. So now I'm looking like my life is about to be sorry because this happened. I mean, I think that's a, a profound perspective and, and wisdom that you offer, not just to all the healthcare providers, um, but even to family, friends, and community members, you know, that they focus on this idea that there is more to life than just what you lost. Absolutely. I don't feel like everyone gets that, you know, and that's why I, I'm just sharing from my perspective, because, I mean, I definitely work with individuals. I know individuals. I know there's hospitals for spinal cord injuries, you know, now that, you know, can really give you and empower you. But none of these resources were shared with the young kid from the east side of Kansas City that was shot and paralyzed. And so for me, my journey following that was literally a self-determined journey that was willing to defeat all of the odds that were stacked up against me. And you felt like this that 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 sense and that it's just sort of gap in what you were offered, did that even start when you moved on to beginning your spinal cord rehab or was it a different environment once you were in that set setting? You know, when I started my spinal cord injury rehab, I would say rehab only lasted 30 days. And when you have something that changes the trajectory of your life and you have two months to be prepped for a new life like this, it's hard. I wasn't really accepting to my rehab. You know, I didn't want to do anything. It took forever for me to be okay with cathing. It took forever for me to be okay with rotating my body or even doing, you know, pressure releases, which if the listeners don't understand what that is, it's more if, if you have any mobility issues and you find yourself being in a seated position a lot, it's necessary for you to relieve pressure from your from your buttocks and um, because it can cause sores and those sores can lead into something even more dangerous for you. And so for me, I didn't want to do none of it, but because I wasn't aware of my situation, but I was aware of the doctors coming in every day saying, can you feel this today? Every day I woke up, I thought I was going to feel something. And so with that, going through rehab was the hardest thing for me because I didn't care about what they were teaching me. You know, it sounds like all along the way you were encountering just issues and, and gaps in the outlook and clarity about what you should be working on and what the challenges were going to be over time. 
after the first year of being paralyzed, I ended up getting diagnosed with a stage four pressure ulcer. I got out the hospital. I was working a full-time job prior to my injury, of course, trying to be a better father. So for me, I thought this was a place where now I have to go back to work, right? Like my job is helping with my insurance, all of this, but at some point I got to go back to work. Like after five months, I was already back to working full time, eight hours a day. My job wasn't aware of how to serve people with disability. So one, I go back into a space where everybody knew me before. So now I'm looked at different. The space isn't very accessible, right? So I'm, I'm dealing with that barrier. I'm dealing with the fact that everyone made me feel like I needed to get back to the normalcy of life instead of accepting this new life of mine the same way I needed to. That led to me basically having that pressure ulcer. Um, after the first year, I got on bed rest. You know, again, I didn't care about it as much. The bed rest went from a few hours a day to um, t about 21 hours a day, you know, like I literally could not get up because it was just that bad. I did, I did all type of things when it came to trying to help this wound heal from wound backs to, you know, trying to eat better to drinking different insure and all these different, uh, protein shakes. And all to say is that, you know, after year two, I'm still defeated, right? It got worse before it got better. And, you know, and it was all these factors that made it where it became worse. I just never had time to accept, to heal, to actually be something more. Instead, I was kind of forced back into a life that wasn't accepting to me. And I'm overweight, you know, so if I haven't shared it with anyone, I was like 230 pounds probably when I first got injured. So maybe my max got to 250, but I'm only 5'4". Um, so it was definitely, uh, I was very big and that caused other health issues. You know, it was hard to lift myself up. I just hate looking in a mirror. One day I was getting out the hospital bed and getting back in my wheelchair and my daughter looked at me. This is probably like a year into bed rest. And my daughter looked at me and she was like, daddy, you're getting in your Superman chair. It goes back to what I said at the beginning about how no one gave me hope. My daughter had literally spoke life into me. That was the moment that I was, I was so weak at that time. No one else gave me that strength. My doctors didn't, my, my therapist didn't, my family didn't. Everyone accepted how I felt. Everyone accepted where I was in life. But my daughter, no, she put a cape on me. And that was when I took up a course at Johnson County Community College in Kansas City. And I took up a dietitian course. And I would go to campus for two hours a day. I was still on barriers for 21 hours. The other hour that I, I had was my commute. The moment I opened up a book on nutrition, it changed my life. I never saw food in that way. You know, again, I grew up in what they refer to as food deserts, where fast food and corner stores are probably where you get most of your produce or anything, right? And that's what I knew. I just started to eat different. I started to just be guided through the things I was learning. And I would say within a year, I had lost over 100 pounds. So I was going through all these practices of eating better, doing better. I couldn't do exercise because I was still on bed rest, but I could eat better. But I was still in denial. I had never lost weight. I had finally became Superman in my own sense. And now it was time to actually serve others through that. And I started disabled, but not really in a hospital bed. I was literally about to get out of the hospital in April, and I started the nonprofit organization. So what is DBNR, or disabled but not really, doing in terms of working with individuals in, in somewhat of a similar situation or other disability situations as you? So disabled but not really uh, mission is to instill a physical limitless mindset that breeds courage, confidence, and competence. We have a 12-week program called the Help Me Fit Challenge where we really dig into the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of the individuals that we serve. We work with those with physical disabilities as well as 
there are exceptions depending on your your ability to do certain work. But we try to be very open minded and open our doors to anyone that's just trying to take control of their life. So disabled but not really is a way that we can create a space that not only one person that identifies with similar disabilities, but you can be in a space where there are people in different situations than you that you can find empowerment um, and motivation through to help you have the courage to see more in your life and the things that you do. So it's big on peer support and community, as well as just individuals pushing past their mental limits. And the participants in the program, you know, on your website, they're listed as athletes. Are those people who've completed the program? Once you sign up for our Help Me Fit Challenge, we do give you a title as an athlete. We want you to feel empowered. To me, an athlete is someone that is willing to have the courage and ability to push themselves and challenge themselves through some type of activities that become more rather it's physical, mental, or emotional. To see that hurdle and not let it limit you. Exactly. So Wesley, going back, age 24, Wesley, in the ICU, when all the challenges ahead of you were starting to come into focus, what would you offer in support? Hope. I just give them the ability to see themselves outside of the circumstances that they're living in. Finding the right representation for people to be able to see that their story resonates with someone else. Like for me, I think that those are the things that could have literally gave me so much power and maybe eliminated the levels of defeat that I faced. Wesley, you're our unique example of not being defined by your trauma, condition, or disability but rather having been transformed into a categorically stronger person. And we thank you so much for sharing your story and everything you're trying to do also to share with others in this situation. Daniel, I really appreciate the platform. I really appreciate the ability to just um, allow me to share the story, especially from just the medical side too, and just you know my insight on that, because I do believe that we can all become better with understanding and knowledge. The beauty of all of this right now is that, you know, there are a lot of people that want to do good and do better, and this can guide you into that. Want to learn more about the conditions discussed in this episode and other factors that could impact your brain health? For the latest on causes, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and management of more than 250 of some of the most common and rare neurologic conditions, please visit brainandlife.org forward slash disorders. So Wesley Hamilton just shared with us his story about becoming a father and then within a year actually finding himself in a hospital bed recovering from a thoracic spinal cord injury from a gunshot. I'm now joined by a world-renowned medical expert in spinal cord injuries. Dr. Barth Green is a spine surgeon, teacher, researcher, and has founded several nonprofit health initiatives. He works at University of Miami, where he has led their neurosurgery department for over 22 years, specializing in the surgical care of people with spinal cord injuries. Beyond the hospital walls, Dr. Green in 1985 co-founded the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, an internationally acclaimed spinal cord injury and paralysis research center. And he also co-founded Shake a Leg Miami, an adaptive water sports center, combining education and recreation to serve thousands of children and adults with physical and developmental and economic challenges and their rehab pathways. You've been there for so many people through these moments after the trauma to help save and preserve their spinal cord function and then throughout their long path of recovery. Dr. Green, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Barth, I wanted to start off. As doctors, we use many terms to describe types of spinal cord injury. Can you describe and explain these for our listeners? Well, basically, we have a lot of classification nomenclature, but usually people come in either with function below their level of injury, which is an incomplete paralysis, or without function, 
below the level of injury. In a case, for example, of a thoracic gunshot wound, usually from the chest down, there's no feeling or movement and the patient is flaccid, meaning no tone in their muscles, no control of bowel or bladder. Cervical injuries, like a couple days ago, we admitted and transferred a jockey who had a, a racing accident and he was quadriplegic and others are paraplegic. A quadriplegic suffers a broken neck or a gunshot wound or another type of injury to their cervical spine. So below the level of the injury, they can't move or feel. Where a paraplegic, it's from the bottom of the neck, the chest down. And then we have a final category, which are lumbar injuries, which are called quite equina injuries. And that is when an individual is injured in the lumbar area and there's not a spinal cord, but nerve roots that are damaged which present a whole new and different array of challenges. And when someone comes in with a complete spinal cord injury where they don't have function below the level of their injury, does that necessarily mean that they won't recover and recuperate some of that function? Well, traditionally, we always said a complete injury with no function has little or no chance of recovery. Statistically, people quote 10%, but the truth is it's really related to the velocity of injury. So someone who has a gunshot wound that severs their spinal cord is less likely to recover function spontaneously. Someone who falls a short distance and has a spinal cord bruise rather than a severe shearing type injury, like a gunshot wound, is more likely to go from complete to incomplete. But still, the chances are not predictable, except for maybe 10%. If you're a race car driver and you're injured at 150 miles or 200 miles an hour in a crash, or you know you have a very high velocity injury, your prognosis for recovery spontaneously is poor, but there's a lot uh, of new opportunities through the research work that's being done at the Miami Project and around the world that gives new opportunities to people, whether they're complete or incomplete. Now, when some people come in with that level of injury, as you said, they are often flaccid or where they, you know, they almost can't move and there's really almost no tone or, or very loose tone in their muscles below that level of injury. But even if that doesn't improve, they're able later on to to do things that they couldn't do in the hospital. Is that an adaptation process that they gain through the rehab then if they're not necessarily recovering more in those specific muscles? Actually, what happens is there's a natural process. If it's a cervical or thoracic cord injury, often they come in what's called spinal shock, which means that they're flaccid, as you described, with no voluntary movement, no feeling, and no control of bowel or bladder. Sometimes, and most often, six to eight weeks later, they evolve out of spinal shock and they go from lower motor neuron, which means they're flaccid, to upper motor neuron, which means they have increased tone, which we term as spasticity. And that same change occurs in the bladder and the bowel. So it becomes a challenge in management and a change of paradigm and the strategy for treating people and avoiding issues. And you had brought up also that there's different ways that the spinal cord can get injured. You know, car accidents like Gloria Stefan, Wesley's experience with a gunshot or high velocity injuries uh, like a jockey or a race car driver or a compression that develops slowly over time with arthritis. Can you help us understand some of these slower processes, how they are so different from the higher velocity injuries or a penetrating injury? Exactly. As you described, there are 
certain neurological conditions like transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre syndrome and others that are especially prevalent in today's day of uh, immunology uh, issues and challenges with viruses and with autoimmune diseases. And so we're seeing more and more patients who present with paralysis um, from other causes, uh, including other neurological disorders like whether it's ALS or other diseases. So it, there is a myriad of challenges and a myriad of opportunities for researchers to try and reestablish function. But there's no doubt that some people just from arthritis narrow their spinal column and they can have a minor fall or just bend over or sleep in the wrong position and become paralyzed. And others, it's a progressive degeneration of the spinal column that chokes off the spinal cord. The slower the onset and the less acute the injury, the more likely that there'll be recovery. There's always then also the challenge in understanding when someone needs surgery, um, you know, or what we often sometimes will describe as decompression. Um, and, you know, sometimes some people after an, an acute injury, they may get it urgently within the first few hours or that first day in the hospital and other people, the doctors may suggest it within a few days or a week later, or maybe even leaving the hospital, doing rehab and coming back and doing it as an outpatient. How is that decision process made? There's a lot of conflicting data, but most often the consensus in this country is the sooner you decompress and stabilize the spinal column, decompress the neurological tissue, spinal cord and nerves, and stabilize the column, the better the outcome. And there is data to support that. But there's so many issues. People can come in with a collapsed lung, with a heart contusion, with a tear in their viscera, their abdomen, their organs. So there's a lot of confounding factors. But honestly, one of the most difficult is getting a patient to the right place at the right time. We were talking about the context of a chronic uh, or slow occurring process in the acute situation or that urgent situation of a trauma from a car accident. You may need that surgery right then or as soon as possible. Uh, so, Barth, one of the other things that gets shown a little bit differently um, at times, whether it's TV or, you know, it's passed along from one person or another, is what is the right bystander or community first aid from when someone has a really bad fall or when someone has an injury that may have affected their spinal cord? What should the people around them be doing? So I think it's very important that first responders immediately, you know, call 911 when they're at an accident scene or someone's down, and then they make sure the patient's positioned so their airway, you know, is, is open and to see if you have to begin resuscitation. And again, um, being near resources, like, you know, it's, it, there's so many simple opportunities to save lives, but, the, but we, our society just isn't equipped with things like the Apple Watches and things like, you know, defibrillators, and, and they should be part of our environment for safety, you know. So the answer is we have a, we have a long way to go, but um, there is a great opportunity through the amazing research that's coming out of places like the Miami Project and other of our collaborators around the world. I mean, they're working to create hypothermia, for example, to cool the brain after head injury, to cool the spinal cord, right at the scene of the accident. Medications that can be applied. It's a simple process if you apply the, this at the right time. So there's so many opportunities. You know, you can't begin to say um, we've got more opportunities. We really do than challenges because the other side of the fence we have an approach is the research going on. A lot of patients, when they get to a big tertiary care center like ours, you know, if they don't get there within 24 hours, are not able to participate in protocols, for example, with medications that have been shown in lower animals in some human trials to reverse paralysis or to limit the damage. 
So timing is very important. We know the same thing occurs, whether it's a cardiac arrest or with a stroke, timing is essential. So people have to respond quickly. And, and if they don't have the knowledge, they need to make sure that people who are notified who do have the knowledge. Uh, and then, you know, we have so many cases of physicians and nurses who have been injured and, you know, diving or whatever, and people run up and start to pick them up and they, they're smart enough to say, don't move me or move me carefully. Or the paramedics go to scoop them. They say, no, no, get a device, you know, stabilize my neck, you know, this type of thing. And so this should be available to the public, you know. So, so we have so many opportunities to, you know, help our first responders, you know, be better educated on spinal injury, brain injury, stroke, and the other neurological conditions, you know. So there's, again, a huge upside, and that's what makes me get up every morning with a smile, is I know we can change the way it is. So it sounds like, you know, aside from always, you know, calling emergency medical services, 911, whether that's through an Apple Watch or a device like that, or even just the first person who responds, check if that person reacts and responds to you, then call for help. Um, then make sure that they ha are in a position that they can breathe without an obstruction. Maybe that requires a little bit of movement, but beyond that, you don't want to do any other movement and Ideally, we all need more education, especially also first responders and more access to things that will help more carefully and appropriately stabilize someone's neck and spine. You mentioned research, and I want to continue in that direction. So you co-founded the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis with NFL Hall of Famer linebacker Nick Bianconti after his son... Mark sustained a spinal cord injury during a college football game. This project, along with other researchers around the world, has been pushing forward our understanding and treatment options for spinal cord. What are you excited about now about treating both the acute injury and improving spinal cord injury recovery and rehab? Well, I think the most um, exciting opportunity lies in combining different parts of healthcare and medicine and science. For example, the Miami Project used to be all about the surgery and the, you know, maybe lowering the body temperature, whether it was cardiac arrest or whether it was trauma, head injury, spinal injury. Now we realize the most important thing is to restore function to the nervous system. And that can happen a lot of different ways. And one of the greatest changes has been the marriage of bioengineering to neuroscience. And today we have a, a quadriplegic driving a race car in Pikes Peak using his brain. This is without anything on his head. It's all implanted. And he can't move his arms very much at all. He can't move his hands but when he thinks accelerate, the race car goes forward. And how does this happen? It happens by putting together engineers, basic scientists, and clinicians into a coalition to restore function. That's the most important new concept. It's a combination of factors that is really exciting. I can tell you countless stories of individuals who spent 30 years not moving their hands, not being able to have a drink or drive their car. And now we just put some electrical stim, it's called neuromodulation, magnetic stimulation, which was first approved by the FDA for the Miami Project like 30 years ago. But putting a cap on their skull, stimulating them, it finds new pathways which they didn't use during development, but these electrical currents finds those pathways, and once the brain learns those pathways, it remembers them. So now we've got a very high-profile member of one of the nonprofits who's able to lift a drink and drink his own soda without someone handing it and holding it over his mouth. We've got a senator, a senior senator from Brazilian government, 
who's now able to drive her own wheelchair and to, and to be more independent because for, she couldn't move her arms or legs for more than 25 years. But this type of neuromodulation, she learned to use them. The pathways were there, and now she's changed her life functionally. So these are what really um, gives us tremendous enthusiasm to put more human and technical and financial resources to increase collaborations between organizations and, and, and universities and countries to make this happen because everybody benefits. It's a win-win-win. So we're very excited. We have a major program called Kids Safe, Run Safe, <coughs> Walk Safe, uh, Cycle Safe, and it's all over the country now, but throughout the uh, Southeast especially, where we have these important programs that teach coaches what to do, teach people working at parks what to do to prevent injuries and then to how to deal with them if they do occur. So there's just so much going on. It's a time of great excitement and great opportunity. One thing I think that often gets overlooked in these discussions about the amazing advances, as you mentioned, is the best thing we can do is prevention of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injuries, both with education and then understanding you know, what to do in the urgent situation. I think there's always the challenge with implantable devices and this new technology that only certain people have access to it. You said even there's limitations and challenges in access to the specialty care for just the surgical services services. Um, where do you think we are going in being able to get more people with spinal cord injury and other injuries that could benefit from neuromodulation access to these kind of therapies and care? Well, this will never be covered by insurance companies. It's very important that we create federal programs to support the opportunity for people with disabilities to optimize their quality of life, their functional status, their happiness, their longevity. And so it is going to take federal funding. Philanthropy is important, foundations, organizations. You know, and we collaborate with dozens and dozens of state, local, and, and federal, and, and global foundations. But it's not enough. The cost, for example, of putting one patient's uh, implants into the brain can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you can imagine if there's millions of people that have the potential to benefit, how are we going to pay for this? Well, one thing for sure, it cuts down medical costs. It, it cuts down complications. It cuts down hospitalizations. It, and by doing that, it has a tremendous positive impact in the healthcare system. But we have to educate our government that they should appropriate the proper funds. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of those funds now are coming through the Department of Defense, but they also early on have appreciated the importance of taking care of their own. And so they've been not only um, providing good care through the Veterans Administration hospitals, they've also moved towards excellence in care in those facilities but they've also supported research at non-military, non-government centers like the Mommy Project uh, to a great degree. So it's a very important change in our system. And, and there's no doubt that today, after being in this field, I've really changed what I say and what I say with integrity and confidence. And I used to say, I'm going to cure paralysis. We're going to cure paralysis. But it was a wish, a hope spiritual thing. Today, it's a reality. I can see a newly paralyzed patient and sit by their bedside and speak to them and their family in a very honest, open way and say, I believe you will regain function. I believe there will be cures for paralysis at different times, different ways, but I believe you won't be the way you are today. The opportunity is real. It's not imaginary. It's not, I hope. It is reality. So that's a very important tool every day that keeps me smiling when I go to work, having the knowledge that there are hundreds of researchers in my hood at the Miami Project 
and thousands of researchers around the world that wake up every day thinking about restoring function, repairing the nervous system. And it's all connected, not just spinal injury, brain injury, peripheral nerve injury, but Alzheimer's, stroke, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. There's nobody who's not affected by these neurological diseases and disorders, and there's nothing but opportunity to change the paradigm. Such powerful words, and I think important for all of us to to remember there is a pathway to recovery and restoring function for many of these conditions, including spinal cord injury. You heard it from him, Dr. Barth Green, but for our listeners in our community, I also want to make sure that you heard that he said, we need your advocacy and support for more research funding and for access to care and some of these rehab and recovery devices that are going to be important for so many members in our community, you know, please, you know, look to support, you know, the American Academy of Neurology, the American Academy of Neurosurgeons and other patient organizations that advocate for the community to have what needed and for the research to move forward. Dr. Barth Green, it's been an honor getting a chance to speak with you, hear about the pathway that you've taken to follow the leadership of these many individuals who are recovering and working towards a new world. It's been my pleasure. It's been my privilege. And I ain't done yet. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us today on the Brain and Life podcast. Follow and subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss our weekly episodes. You can also sign up to receive the Brain and Life magazine for free at brainandlife.org and even get the Espanol version. For each episode, you can find out how to connect with our team and our guests along with great resources in our show notes. We love it when we hear your ideas or questions. You can send these in by email to blpodcast at brainandlife.org and leave us a message at 612-928-6206. You can also follow the Brain and Life magazine and me on any of your preferred social media channels. These episodes would not be possible without the Brain and Life podcast team, including Nicole Lussier, our public engagement program manager, Rachel Coleman, our public engagement coordinator, and Twin City Sound, our audio editing partner. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Correa, connecting with you from New York City and online at NeuroDr. Correa. Most importantly, thanks to our community members that trust us with their health and everyone living with neurologic conditions. We hope together we can take steps to better brain health and each thrive with our own abilities every day. Before you start the next episode, we would appreciate it if you could give us five stars and leave a review. This helps others find the Brain and Life podcast. See you next week.